Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. So we continue reading from Transcendental Diary. Because of his vast responsibilities in Africa and all the problems he has to face there, he expressed his inability to attend the festival in Mayapur this year. Out of the 17 devotees in Africa, only five have missionary visas. The rest will have to leave due to a change in immigration laws. Most of the local men that had joined have now left, stealing practically everybody, everything of value as they went. So the question comes to mind, he wrote, why are we here? At least I have a little hope that the Africans will ever take, at least I have little hope that the Africans will ever take seriously to Krishna consciousness. Brahmananda explained that their primary field for preaching is among the Indian community, but they are also being forced to leave by the government. He gave a very bleak overview of the potential for preaching in the entire continent. This is really, this is really a disturbed part of the world and offers very little opportunity to spread our movement. Americans cannot travel to the Congo or Uganda. We are already banned in Zambia. Tanzania has refused our attempt to register there and I have been arrested twice there. Ethiopia, from where I have just returned in December, is very tense and going communist very rapidly. Mozambique just had a revolution and there is an open war in Angola. <clears throat> our men just returned from Sudan which is incredibly poor and destitute, and so is Chad, Central Africa Republic, etc. Only Nigeria seems to offer an opportunity of establishing a center. All the other the GBCs have civilized areas of the world that are developed to spread this movement. There were two bright spots though. He has paid off $1,860 from his BBT debt of $12,000. And in Mauritius, a small band of brahmacharis are being well received and preaching enthusiastically all around the island. Prabhupada was sympathetic but purposeful. In his reply, he encouraged Brahmananda to work vigorously and continue with his efforts to preach. He also suggested he base himself in Mauritius, which Prabhupada described as a nice place by the sea. As for whether he should remain in Africa or not, Prabhupada said that will have to be discussed by the GBC. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Okay, so we're reading today from the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, reading from canto number six, chapter number five, entitled Narad Muni Cursed by Prajapati Daksha. And today we're reading from text number 38. Evam tam niranukrosho Evam tam niranukrosho Balanam mati biddhare Parshada Madhya Charasi Yasoha Nirapatrapa Evam Tham Nirano Krosho Balana Mati Bidhare Parshada Madhya Charasi 
यशोहा निरपत्रपाशो क्रोशो बालाधरे पाशदा मध्य चरसी यशोहा निरपत्रपा without compassion <coughs> balanam of innocent inexperienced boys mati bhed contaminating the consciousness hare of the supreme personality of godhead <coughs> parshada madhye among the personal associates Jarasi travel Yashaha defaming the supreme personality of godhead Nirapatrapa although you do not know what you are doing you are executing sinful activities without shame translation and purport by his divine grace let us see bhaktivedanta swami shila prabhu pad ki translation <coughs> prajapati daksha continued thus committing violence against other living entities and yet claiming to be an associate of lord vishnu you are defaming the supreme personality of godhead you needlessly created a mentality of renunciation in innocent boys therefore you are shameless and devoid of compassion how could you travel with the personal associates of the supreme lord purport the mentality of prajapati daksha still continues even today when young boys join the krishna consciousness movement Their fathers and so-called guardians are very angry at the propounder of the Krishna consciousness movement because they think that their sons have been unnecessarily induced to deprive themselves of material enjoyments of eating, drinking and merry making. Karmis, fruitive workers think that one should fully enjoy his present life in the material world. and also perform some pious activities to be promoted to the higher planetary systems for further enjoyment in the next life 
A yogi, however, especially a bhakti yogi, is callous to the opinions of this material world. He is not interested in traveling to the higher planetary systems of the demigods to enjoy a long life in an advanced materialistic civilization. <coughs> As stated by Prabodhananda Saraswati, Kevalyam narakayate vidasapur akasha pushpayate. For a devotee merging into the Brahman, existence is hellish. And life in the higher planetary systems of the demigods is will of the wisp. A phantasmagoria with no real existence at all. A pure devotee is not interested in yogic perfection, travel to higher planetary systems or oneness with Brahman. He is interested only in rendering service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Since Prajapati Daksha was a karmi, he could not appreciate the great service Narad Muni had rendered his 11,000 sons. Instead, he accused Narad Muni of being sinful and charged that because Narad Muni was associated with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord would also be defamed. Thus, Daksha criticized that Narad Muni was an offender to the Lord, although he was known as an associate of the Lord. Shila Prabhupada Ki Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshodan Militam Yenatasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yenabhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uta Padakamalan Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Dam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitam Shcha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpataru Vyascha Pasindu Vyavacha Patitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhunitya Ananda Shri Advaita Gadada Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Shila Prabhupada Ki so here Prajapati Daksha is continuing his criticism of Narad Muni. Srila Prabhupada says that when young boys become interested in Krishna consciousness or children become interested and the preachers encourage them to turn away from material life, then their parents become very angry. Actually, we were just reading about Brahmananda Prabhu in Africa and even Brahmananda Prabhu and his brother Gargamuni Prabhu, when they joined, even their parents, his mother specifically, was very disturbed. <coughs> they tell the story of how both of them had joined in uh, 26 Second Avenue in 1966. And then one time the mother, she came to see what they were doing, how they were living. So Prabhupada was lecturing and then their mother walked in. So then Prabhupada arranged for her to have a seat. So everyone else was sitting on the floor, but Srila Prabhupada gave her a seat. So she was sitting on the seat and then she was looking. And so then after the lecture, she came to Srila Prabhupada and she said, uh, so what are my boys doing here? So Prabhupada explained, they are, um, 
they're serving Krishna very, very nicely. So she was becoming, <laughs> she, was, she was not so happy about that. And then Prabhupada said, you know, they are living here, we are feeding them, we are giving them shelter, we are giving them service to Krishna, uh, we're taking care of them very nicely, we're moulding them into becoming ideal citizens. Then Prabhupada looked at her and said, uh, would you like to give a donation? <laughs> so she was already thinking, I can't. So Prabhupada said, would you like to give a donation? Then she looked at Prabhupada and she said, I already donated my two sons. Prabhupada said, you donated them? Okay, that's okay then. That's okay. So Prabhupada tri tricked her. So she accepted, I donated my sons. So like this, the parents are sometimes... Uh, people actually feel this renunciation is the biggest, like... Um, biggest loss even now I travel and often I meet people you know you sit next to people on a on a plane where they have no idea but then they see you then they say like who are you you're a monk so you get into many conversations with people and so many people they say this is terrible you know like you're young you had an education you could have done so many things in your life they can't for them, renunciation is the, it's the most terrible thing. They can't, you know. There's actually one story of uh, one criminal. He had committed some crime. So he was running, running away, trying to not get caught by the police. So then he decided, like, I need to go somewhere where no one will find me. So of all the places he decided to hide in, he decided to join a Hare Krishna temple. He thought, no one will find me here. So this criminal, he joined the Hare Krishna temple. He says, I want to join, I want to become a monk. So he came in the temple and then he started living as a brahmachari. So, you know, he was doing everything that they do in a Hare Krishna temple. Anyway, finally, after living in the Hare Krishna temple, hiding from the police, he actually became attracted to Krishna. He said, these are really nice people. This is a great life. But then because he got purified by the process, he felt, oh no, but I committed a crime, I should be honest. The devotee is honest. So after some months of living, the police didn't catch him, but he himself went to the police station. And he said, actually, I have to confess, I committed this crime. And uh, I'm now coming to admit what I did wrong. So then they uh, called a court case on him, so then the, they came to the court and then, so then the judge, he was fascinated, like this is the first time ever a criminal himself has come to admit. So then the judge was looking at him and he said like, so, you know, you hid out in a Hare Krishna temple, like what were you doing all day? So he said, I was sleeping on the floor. We wake up every day at 4.30 in the morning. We have a cold shower. Uh, we go out all day and uh, in the rain or the shine and, uh, you know, we ask people for donations. Um, and, you know, we eat very little, very, very simple. And uh, we sleep just a few hours every day. So... <laughs> The judge was hearing all of this and then he looked at him and he said, I should be sentencing you to prison. But to be honest, the place where you're living sounds worse than prison. <laughs> so I should be sending you to jail. But to be honest, the place that you're in sounds even worse than jail. Maybe you should just stay there, you know. So the judge just couldn't understand it. Like, why would someone live like this? So here... Daksha, he just can't understand, like, uh, why someone uh, would just induce others to turn away from material enjoyment. Daksha also has some religiosity about him, and he also believes that later on in life, someone should renounce. But first, they should experience all the pleasure. To induce someone immediately to give up everything is very, very bad. 
But what Daksha doesn't realize is that there are three ways in which one can learn. <clears throat> the best way to learn is that you simply hear the knowledge and you get the lesson and you learn. This is called first class intelligence. But if one doesn't learn like that, then it's explained you have to hear, but you also have to observe. And then you learn. That's called second class intelligence. But then it's said that third class intelligence is that you hear, you observe, but you still don't understand, and therefore you have to experience. So Daksha's philosophy is that everyone should have to experience. They should experience material life. They should experience everything. And then, after doing all of that, then they can renounce because they've experienced, therefore they have knowledge. But Daksha doesn't understand that first-class intelligence means that one understands the point without even, have to, uh, even having to experience it. So this is uh, what the preachers do. Narad Muni, by his deep realization, by his deep conviction, he speaks to someone and he's able to awaken realization within them because of his own realization. And therefore, if someone hears from someone who is uh, very, very powerful, very, very realized, then simply by their words, uh, all of their material attachments can be cut. The Bhagavatam says this is the definition of a sadhu. The todu sangha mutsrija sadhu satseta buddhiman shanta evasya chindanti mano sangam ukti bi. That the words of a saintly person are razor sharp. Sadhu or saintly person means one who cuts. But how does he cut? Using the sharp words that come from his mouth. And what does he cut? Mano Vyasangam Ukti Bi. All the attachments that are within the mind. Therefore, a sadhu is known as one who cuts because his razor sharp words cut all of the attachments that are within the mind. And so, uh, Narad Muni, by his words, he was able to cut the attachment, whatever was there, of these 11,000 sons, and he was able to induce them into a life of renunciation. People think renunciation is a great loss because when you become renounced, you lose all your ambition. People think life is about being ambitious. Life is about achieving things in the world. Life is about exploring everything that the world has to offer. And therefore, when someone takes up spirituality and becomes renounced, it's the greatest loss because they lose their ambition. But would you say a spiritual person is unambitious? <clears throat> Actually, a spiritual person is the most ambitious. It's not that when we take up renunciation or we take up Krishna consciousness, we lose our ambition, but rather we develop the biggest ambition, the highest ambition, the most uh, elevated ambition, which is to attain eternal, uh, unending, pure, uh, divine love of God. This is the biggest thing to aim for. And when one uh, pursues the highest ambitions, then they're the ones that actually make <clears throat> the biggest impact in the world. Therefore, Srila Prabhupada, can anyone say he was unambitious? He, at the age of 70, traveled the world 14 times, opened uh, 108 temples, uh, initiated 5,000 disciples, and uh, did so many amazing things. Because uh, his ambition went beyond the material and his ambition went to the spiritual. And when we are ambitious for spiritual things, then <coughs> life becomes uh, very, very magical. So here, 
uh, Daksha just uh, can't understand it. He says, uh, e Prabhupada says, every preacher will be criticized. If there's no opposition, then it probably means you're not doing that much. As soon as you start doing something, definitely there will be opposition. And therefore, if a preacher faces opposition, they can take heart. It means that they're actually doing the work of God. Sometimes they give the analogy, in India they have balconies like uh, on the rooftop and uh, sometimes people are flying kites on the top. So sometimes this analogy is given that a sadhu is walking past and there's one child on the top of the building and the child is flying a kite. And on the ground floor, the parents are watching television. So what happens is the sadhu is walking by and he sees the child flying the kite but he sees that because the child is so fixed on seeing the kite in the sky that the child doesn't realize that he's coming to the edge of the building and as the child is coming to the edge of the building the sadhu on the ground is shouting watch out you're gonna fall watch out you're gonna fall and the mother and father that are on the ground floor watching TV, they're saying, just be quiet, why are you making so much noise? I'm watching television here. And uh, this, is, this analogy is used to explain what's going on in the world. That people are basically committing spiritual suicide. The preacher is coming in and trying to help them. And in the course of helping them to save their life, those who are watching by, engaged in material life, are thinking that the preacher is causing a disturbance. This is basically uh, what Daksha um, was thinking. And so, um, one should be ready that when they try to uh, share the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, then some people definitely, they will become uh, agitated, they won't be happy. Um, therefore the job of a preacher is to make the comfortable uncomfortable those who are comfortable in their material life a preacher must make them <coughs> uncomfortable a preacher must uh, share the words that nobody else will say a preacher must reveal the truths that nobody else will um, dare to reveal a preacher must also speak that which is very, very difficult for people to digest. Once we were in a hospital and there was a... Um, so we were just... There was some, one devotee was in hospital and then we saw two doctors coming out of uh, one room and they were speaking to each other. So I, I don't think they realized, but we overheard them. And one doctor was saying to the other doctor, I love this job. I really love this job, we can help people. But this one part of the job where we have to tell people that they're about to die, this part I really don't like. So this is uh, the job of a preacher, that sometimes they also have to say things that people won't like. They have to say things that people find difficult to digest. They have to also reveal the harsh reality. And, uh, but a preacher must do this because uh, they have to be truthful. Satyam priyam hitam. Austerity of speech means you have to speak the truth. But they try to speak it in a way which is priyam, pleasing, and hitam, beneficial. So... Uh, Renunciation is not a bad thing. Although Daksha is uh, criticizing Narad Muni that you created this mentality of renunciation. Actually, renunciation is the most beautiful thing. Because when we become renounced, you're basically saving yourself from uh, so many problems. You're saving yourself from so much disappointment. You're saving yourself from so much frustration. Taking renunciation is like um, taking a bitter medicine. Although that medicine is very, very bitter, 
and sometimes it's very difficult to uh, to put it down your throat. Ultimately, once you take that medicine, you will have an immunization against a bigger disease. And therefore, uh, although the medicine is bitter, the disease is even more uh, painful. And so, better than uh, experiencing the disease is to uh, take the voluntary pain of some renunciation. So therefore, Srila Prabhupada said, these are the four regulative principles of freedom, which almost sounds like a very interesting terminology. How can regulation bring you freedom? But the idea is that when you restrict yourself from certain things, then you save yourself from becoming entangled and attached in more uh, painful ways. And so in this way, renunciation is a very, very beautiful thing. And therefore in the Chaitanya Charitamrita it said, Maha Prabhur Bhakta Ganer Vairagya Pradhan uh, Jahadeki Pritahane Gaura Bhagavan That renunciation is the basic principle sustaining the lives of all devotees. Jahadeki, and when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sees it, uh, Pritahana, he becomes very, very happy to see that people have become renounced because through this renunciation one can uh, achieve something much better. While one is attached to the material world, they can never really experience the bliss of Krishna consciousness. Shilo, uh, Krishna says this in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhogeshvarya prashaktanam tayapar et chaitasham vyavasayatmika buddhi samado nuvidiyate. While one is attached to bhoga, enjoyment, and aishvarya, opulence, vyavasayatmika buddhi, the resolute determination for devotional service, samado nuvidiyate, never takes place. And so by becoming renounced and somewhat detached, one can then become very, very focused on what will actually bring them uh, real happiness. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Srila Prabhupada Ki. So if anyone has any question or comment or any clarification you would like, on renunciation, enjoyment, uh, or any of these points, uh, Daksha and uh, Naradhani. No questions? Any comments? Um, regarding renunciation, I just, in this particular situation, that our renunciation is actually uh, let's say double, we have to be doubly renounced because when we become renounced externally in the society, then we, we actually get all this opulence, we can say, you know, as a recognized, you know, you get glorified for that. Society. You get glorified, you get lots of followers, you get uh, lots of, lots of monetary, you know, <laughs> things, and also you get facilities. So you have to, in this sense, you have to. Be extra renounced to be, although you are renounced, you take a renounce to order, you have to be extra renouncing even this thing. So it's like yeah. a double renunciation. Yeah, yeah. yeah nice so point. It's, 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 it's a tricky, tricky thing. This, this is not the end. The, the renunciation, the position of renouncing in a society is not the end. Yeah. It's, it's just there to be another actual, actual renunciation. Yeah. Yeah, so there's external renunciation, which is you walk away from certain types of enjoyments and all of these things. And when you do that, the irony is that sometimes you get name, fame, facility, um, and then you really have to deep the, develop the deep inner renunciation, where you uh, achieve all of those things, but then internally you don't again become attached. And of course, in the history of the world, we see that often this happens, that when one becomes externally renounced, then they receive even more. And when they receive even more, then sometimes that can cause again 
they fall back into enjoyment again. So therefore, this uh, double um, double renunciation that once you've done it externally, then you have to deeply imbibe it internally, and in this way, um, we actually become uh, truly renounced. Um, thank you. Very nice point. Yeah. I mentioned in my tradition you have to do first couple of nothing, no. Yeah, but when they are doing it, uh, when they are uh, trying to do Shatrushya, to do Shatrushya, to do the Shatrushya Kana, so to uh, give our senses, or to receive nourishment, and everything, uh, doing up, up to there, doing the process of devotional service. Doesn't it mean that initiation is coming automatically? Yeah. So actually, with regards to renunciation, you'll find three types of statements in Shastra. One statement will tell you renunciation helps you in your devotion. Another statement will tell you renunciation is dangerous to your devotion. And another statement will say renunciation comes automatically as a result of devotion. You'll find all three of these statements. And all of them are true. Number one, renunciation is useful for devotional service. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I quoted it, that if you hold on to material things and at the same time try and worship Krishna, then your mind will become distracted and deviated and therefore it's not good. Therefore, renunciation is useful while you're practicing. Therefore, when we take an initiation, it's a renunciation because you're saying you're going to follow the four regulative principles. That's a renunciation. So first statement is that renunciation is useful. Second statement is that renunciation can be dangerous. Why do you think renunciation can be dangerous in your spiritual life? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's another more specific reason. Yeah, that and that's kind of similar. Basically, what the scriptures say is that through renunciation, you can become very hard-hearted. Renunciation makes you, too much renunciation makes you very hard-hearted. You become, uh, you kind of uh, lose sense of how to interact, how to be sensitive, how to open your heart. And therefore, for bhakti to have a soft heart is very, very important. And therefore, sometimes it's said that renunciation is dangerous because it, because it can make you hard-hearted. And sometimes it's said that renunciation comes automatically. That when you have the higher taste of Krishna consciousness, then you automatically, Vasudeva, Bhagavati, Bhakti Yoga, Prayojita, Janaya, Teshuvaira, Gyam, Gyanam, Cha, Yad, Ahaitukam. Um, renunciation and knowledge automatically follow when one has devotion for Vasudev. That is also said. So all three of these statements are true. And therefore in Vaishnav circles, we practice a very particular type of renunciation. And what is that type of renunciation or vairagya called? Yukta vairagya. Anashakta uh, shavishayan yatharham upayunjata nirbandha krishna sambande yuktam vairagyam uchyate. That um, anashakta shavishayan, when one is not attached to material things, Yatarham upayunjata Krishna Sambandha. But one utilizes everything they have and connects it in service to Krishna. Yuktam Vairagyam Uchate. That type of renunciation is known as Yukta Vairagya. 
So what we do in our renunciation is we don't necessarily reject the world. But what we learn to do is utilize everything in the world but for Krishna's enjoyment. And in that way we become renounced without becoming hard-hearted. Because we learn how to employ everything for Krishna. So this is the type of renunciation given to us by Rupa Goswami. Is that okay? Jai Shri Shri Vijay Gauranga Dhanitai Ki Yeah. So in the beginning of our devotional journey, uh, because we are still progressing, we require some level of reciprocation. Because we're not pure devotees. The pure devotee doesn't need any reciprocation. The pure devotee is just happy to serve. Nadhanam, Najanam, Nasundarim, Kavitam, Vajakati, Shakamaye. I don't need followers, I don't need popularity. Those are big things. They don't even need appreciation or acknowledgement. Many times the great devotees were doing services and nobody knew. Uh, nobody was aware um, but they were confident that Krishna is in my heart Krishna knows what I'm doing and therefore the great devotees because they're connected with Krishna then whether people of this world or society of this world acknowledges their service or not it makes no difference to them like Mother Teresa she had this uh, poem on her by the side of her bed you know that one? It's called Do It Anyway. You heard that poem? It's a very nice poem because uh, uh, it explains that in the ultimate sense uh, everything is between you and God. Um, I'll just get it out for you. It's a nice poem actually. I'll read it for you. So the devotee realizes this, that Krishna is seeing everything uh, it's not really, doesn't really matter uh, whether people acknowledge me or not. So she writes in her poem. Sorry, give me one second. People are often unreasonable, illogical and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Yeah, that's very powerful, no? That's very high. Like, ultimately, whether the world appreciates me or not, it's between me and Krishna. Krishna knows. But we're not there. That's very far. That's very high. And therefore, in our stage of spiritual life, we try to form relationships, we try to be in a community where we feel that exchange, that reciprocation, that love that um, we require. And so we try to create communities like that, where we appreciate each other, where we reciprocate, where we um, express our um, gratitude towards other devotees. And that's very nice. We should create communities like that. 
but eventually when one becomes uh, advanced enough they only seek to give that appreciation they only seek to give that gratitude they only seek to give those kind words but um, but they don't require it themselves and imagine you would be in a community of 50 individuals where everyone doesn't desire any gratitude, appreciation or acknowledgement for themselves but is very enthusiastic about giving it to others that is basically the spiritual world um, so until we're there um, we try to surround ourselves in a community where we feel that love and that kindness and that reciprocation but internally we try to develop that sense that I'm not doing this because people thank me for it uh, even if they didn't, I do it anyway because in the final analysis it's not just between me and them it's between me and God does that make sense? it's high it's high but that's where we're trying to go that's pure devotional service it's very high so until we're there, we have Vaishnava relationships and we try to... Um, but the, the pure devotee actually is said in giving, they feel like they're actually receiving. Right. We give to then receive something. But the pure devotee, the giving is the receiving. The fact that someone accepts their service, the fact that Krishna accepts their service, the fact that they're able to do something, that in itself is the receiving. So, it's amazing. When, when one is a pure devotee, that they're able to give is the receiving. This is the highest level of selflessness. Okay, any last points? Thank you so much. Kantaraj Shimad Bhagatam ki chai. Shilabhubhupada ki chai.